Hello, this is chapter two. The starting place, data and distributions. Here we go. And the first part of the text reviews uh, the populations and samples and how we're drawing um, in each experiment samples from the population because we'll never be able to um, for certainly large populations like the human race or something like that be able to uh, draw the whole population. And the first part of the book gives an example of a poll. How many people believe that global warming is a serious problem? And they gave the example that there were two different percentages drawn from the survey. And they were asking, well, does that mean that, you know, people significantly differ on this question, depending on what type of day or uh, time of day that you uh, ask them? And they noted that there were different, there was a difference in terms of the sample size here. 63% in the 63% uh, group that said yes. There's a thousand people surveyed with a margin of error of plus or minus three. That means 60% or 66% said yes. But in this survey, there were 5,000 people surveyed and a plus, plus or minus of 1.6. So as you can see, the number of people um, in this group in the survey is much higher and the margin of error is much smaller. And what that says is um, the book was noting that you can be more sure of the results. So that's what you want to look at is sample size and margin of error. Then they give the terms of population and sample. Pretty simple, right? Population is a group of individuals that the researcher is uh, seeking to learn about in a research study. And they give the example of all individuals in the United States. Um, impossible to survey all individuals in the United States, obviously. And so you're gonna pull a sample of people. And what you wanna do in your study is hopefully extrapolate from the sample to the population. And you can do that again by getting a big sample size because that's going to be hopefully more representative of your population. A sample is a group of individuals chosen from the population to represent it in the research study and a set of people who answer the question in your poll. How well the sample represents the population of interest depends on a couple things that they talked about in the book. Um, sample size, obviously, the bigger the sample size, the more likely it's going to be representative of the population. The way in which the sample was chosen, for example, if you surveyed people on the coast of California versus away from the coast on certain issues, um, you'd probably find a significantly different, so on some issues you might not find much difference but on certain things you might find a big difference depending on who you're surveying there. So you wanna get a mix of all Californians, not just surveying the coast or uh, away from the coast, for example, if you're looking at all Californians. And uh, the number of people chosen who actually responded or participated. So imagine you know calling and phone calling a bunch of different people surveying in California using the same example. And um, let's say you got a bunch of people that answered your survey, but there were people that just picked up their phone or were home in the midday. Let's say you called them during the midday. So obviously um, that's going to affect the representativeness of your sample, which of course that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make our sample that we draw for our survey or poll, let's say, um, representative of the population that we're studying. Um, the book next talks about sampling error, which exists anytime we collect data from a sample of a population. Obviously, it's impossible to get the population, exact population, from um, data from the sample. And remember, each sample is a different subset of the population and will provide different scores. Our goal is to estimate the population mean using the sample mean. And the estimate of the population mean from the sample will most always be wrong, of course. And that's why we um, calculate what's called sampling error, which is the difference between the observations from the population and from the sample that represents the population in a study. So you will always have sampling error. And then you saw that margin of error that you see in surveys. Well, the margin of error reported for polls provides essentially an estimate of the sampling error. Margin of error is an estimate of how far off, again, similar, same thing with the sampling error, right? Uh, how far off the reported percentage in our data is likely to be from the population percentage. Um, and of course, again, it size matters, right? Um, you wanna look at uh, the poll and see if it's useful, and you wanna look at your sample size and margin of error. That was kind of the main um, topics for the first area of the book, chapter two. 
Then it goes into talking about types of data collected in research in psychology. Um, this is really important, um, kind of taking a look at a couple of these key topics here. Many behaviors can be defined in multiple ways. Researchers need to know what to measure from individuals in the sample when they collect their data. And so thus we have the operational definition and that's how you define um, your behavior, the way that your behavior is measured in a study. It provides a way for researcher to measure the behavior that is not directly observable. They give the example of depression, um, which we'll go over in a sec. And remember these two terms that we reviewed in chapter one, um, construct validity. Um, it does affect construct validity, the degree to which a measure is an accurate measure of the behavior of interest. Of course it does, right? The way that we define it is going to um, affect the validity of it. And of course it affects internal validity, it affects external validity too, but the book really highlighted internal validity as well, which is how well a study provides causal information about the behavior of interest. And we'll see um, an example of that. Um, in this next example of a study. So let's say you were examining uh, whether medication SSRIs helps people with depression or um, whether therapy and SSRIs helps people with depression with an inpatient population. So you have different ways that you can operationally define depression here. Um, the book, I sort of tweaked it a little bit from the book, but similar. Example one, observers ratings of how withdrawn they seem based on the number of social interactions with other patients. Um, example two, a score on a self-reported questionnaire like the Beck depression um, inventory. Example three, the clinician assessment. This would rely on the clinician's uh, assessment of their depression, um, their observations and uh, interactions with them in therapy, let's say. And example four, how often the patients watch TV. So let's say you use that as an example of your operational definition for depression. And um, the dependent as the dependent variable, the dependent variable in example four obviously has low uh, construct validity, I mean, I would imagine. Um, it doesn't define the symptoms of depression well. And as a result, if we use it, our study would have low internal validity. We would not be able to tell if our intervention was effective um, based on the amount of uh, minutes that they watch TV. This is a really important topic to uh, really nail down. And um, the way that I like to remember things that really helped me in college was to create uh, acronyms or create little hooks in my memory. Um, that's if you watch my memory and study skills video for extra credit um, <clears throat> that I posted in Canvas. Um, this will kind of, uh, this sort of talks about this too or, or highlights this idea, <coughs> excuse me, which is to create different hooks in your memory, not just through repetition, repeating over and over, saying these things over and over, but creating little associations that are going to enable you to come back to that information in a nifty and uh, catchy way. And the way that I remember the four scales of measurement is to think of NOIR, so N-O-I-R, and it goes in the order that you want to remember them in as well. And so I think of film noir, I think of some strange film noir, um, I don't know, pie or something kind of uh, different, moon. And then um, that helps me to remember the scales. So I connect it to the weird show moon or the weird show pie where they're actually uh, using these interval scales in some way to figure out pie or something like that. I don't know, but I like to connect it that way. N-O-I-R, let's see if that's effective for you. Um, the first one is, oh, and N-O-I-R, let's take a look, N O is nominal scale and ordinal scale, and then we have I, the interval scale, and ratio scale. So there's the NOIR. Let's take a look at, um, oh, why are they important to learn? They will help you to determine what inferential statistics to use um, in the studies that you conduct, for example, in correlational studies, and they are the best. They'll help you also figure out the best descriptive statistics to use to describe your results. The nominal scale is a scale of data measurement that involves non-ordered categories. There's uh, responses. So there's no rankings, absolutely. Um, you could say, give examples of different types of mood or just a list of colleges you're interested in, not colleges as they're ranked according to the US News and World Report, for example, but a list of colleges just of, um, that you know, you've heard of or something like that. Uh, ordinal scale. 
ordered categorical responses, they're rankings. These one actually have rankings, but the categories are not necessarily equally spaced from each other is what the book says. So we're going up a little step up from the nominal scale, which doesn't have rankings. And we have a list that does have rankings, but they're not separated equally on the scale. And so if you could see right here, you, I have the scale of uh, the example, report your anxiety level on a scale of not at all anxious, a little anxious, fairly anxious and very anxious. And um, someone can report here or here or here, but it's not necessarily that these rankings are equally spaced numerically from each other. You will find that different though in the next one, which is uh, appropriately called the interval scale. And uh, those are numerical responses that are equally spaced, but the scores are not ratios of each other because there's no true zero point. The book talks about that in the example of a scale on 1 to 10, where higher, the higher number indicates higher agreement. How much would, would you agree upon uh, with the following statement? Global warming is a serious um, issue that faces society today. So the scale is on 1 to 10. Um, each one, of course, 1, 2, 3, all the way to 10. They're equally spaced in terms of your higher agreement, um, sort of indicates by the number. But there's no zero, so you can't have a true ratio. Like in the last one, a uh, ratio scale where there is a true zero point. These are no numerical responses where scores are ratios of each other because they have a true zero point. And there's multiple examples that they give in the book of uh, the number of correct responses on a memory test, weight, age, accuracy on a task, speed to complete a task. So those are the examples of the scales of measurement in the book. Any of the scales of measurements can be used in surveys. Uh, survey score is an operational definition of the behavior of interest uh, they talk about. However, they're limited to an individual's report of their behaviors. People have limited knowledge of themselves, so that's how you're limited in some way, but they're also um, engaged in social desirability bias, not just typical in surveys, but anytime people know that they're being surveyed or watched, um, you can have the potential for this. Um, this is bias created from a respondent's desire to be viewed more favorably by others, what we of course call the Instagram or Facebook um, LinkedIn thing where you're presenting your best persona and you're like, oh my God, these people are doing such amazing things. What's wrong with me? I just did something just very morose and mundane today or something like that. I don't know. Maybe mundane, not morose. Uh, social desirability bias may compromise the validity of the survey. Um, you don't get real, but what people want you to see. And uh, then they talk about systematic or more controlled measures. Uh, these are more direct observations of behavior versus the survey, which relies on self-report. Um, it certainly can increase the internal validity um, in terms of you know direct observation of a behavior versus uh, someone reporting it is going to be a little more, uh, you can say that there's probably a little less uh, social desirability, for example, in the survey getting in the way, but it does decrease the external validity. For example, if you think about in a high controlled setting like a lab, it's going to be a little less like the real world, like watching someone in the real world. So you have some trade-offs with the high control that you can do in a lab where you can control pretty much and eliminate all the variables except for the variable that you're uh, manipulating but you have less applicability perhaps in the real world because it's in an artificial setting where you can also have social desirability, for example, where people aren't acting like they would be in the real world. Um, I kind of talk about it as fly in the wall observations. Um, wouldn't it be lovely if as you know, uh, an intense people watcher and someone interested in human psychology and why people do things the way that they do or why students do the way that they do, um, being someone who used to study students and student success and why are students failing. Um, for example, if I could be a fly in the wall 24 seven for, probably wouldn't wanna be, uh, I know, but um, 24 seven watching a student for a couple days, I'd probably know a lot about that student much more than what they're reporting to me of what they actually um, do in terms of study time versus what they say they do. And um, because people act in a desired way, they gave the example in the book of how older folks did better on a memory task because essentially they tried harder. Um, well, not bashing them old folks. Come on, let's give it, what, is, what do they say, old guys rule or something? You probably are, 
don't like that shirt. Um, but anyway, um, I'm getting there, so maybe I should embrace the shirt someday. Haven't got one yet. Frequency distributions is what's not next talked about. Um, when we collect data, we have a distribution of scores to consider, and that's basically what that is. It's just a set of scores. There's really nifty ways to look at it in a graph um, or the uh, frequency uh, distribution table, which will allow you to give you a really cool visual and an instant idea of the results of your survey and present that to people as well. Um, as you can see right here, if you want to create a frequency distribution graph, um, on the bottom right here, you have uh, the ratings, uh, one through seven, for example, on some Likert scale indi indicating, you know, whether you really like your teach, how cool you think your teacher is, for example. And as you can see right here, this is the count on the Y axis, the count, ah, 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 oh, that was a bad one, I guess, right there. But as you can see here, um, very cool teacher, uh, high ratings, and some people not so cool, so, um, yeah move on there. And um, so uh, this is a creating a frequency distribution table. And as you can see right here, the number of the scores of um, people who think their um, instructor are not cool or cool. Those are the ratings there um, in terms of uh, the scale. And then these are actually the number of raw scores of people who indicate uh, those answers on the scale. Um, and as you can see, lots of people think the instructor is pretty cool. Uh, the percentage, this is broken down right here of uh, how many um, raw scores take up the percentage. And then the cumulative percentage is basically adding up all these and it should, it will always get to 100 at the end if you did it right. Um, the shape of distribution is very important. And um, when we use, learn about inferential statistics, it's hugely important to provide a standardized way of looking at data so that you can say that, for example, your treatment was effective, that this mean is much different than the data on this one right here. And if we have a, a similar distribution, we can make some assumptions about the data that will enable us to tell uh, that our, um, our treatment was in fact uh, effective with a statistical surety. Um, the frequency distribution graph makes it easy to see the shape of the distribution also. The shape of the distribution can take many forms. It can affect the, how the researcher analyzes the data with inferential statistics, as I talked about. And oops. There's two types of distributions. There's a symmetrical distribution, and ideally this is kind of the way that you want your data to look like, um, unless you're purposely looking for your data to be skewed. But um, this is what they call a standard bell curve. Um, the shape of distribution shows a mirror Im image on either side of the middle score. So as you can see right here, if you look at this, this is an exact mirror image of the other. And by necessity or by obviousness, if you added up all these scores, they would equal and subtracted from these scores, it would equal zero because they're the exact same scores. Um, standardized scores typically show a symmetrical distribution. If it doesn't, you have to account for it in your statistics. We'll talk about that later. Uh, and this is what's called a skewed distribution. The shape of the distribution shows a clustering of scores either at the low end of the scale or the high end of the scale. Um, the positive skew, negative skew, um, I'm all about like, how do I remember it? Okay, so here's the way that I remember it is what's at the first part of the scale um, what they call the lower end of the scale. See lower scores right here, but I just call it the first part of the scale that I'm looking at, okay, on the x-axis. And if it's positive, in other words, has a lot of scores right there, positive right at the beginning, it's a positive skew. If it's negative at the beginning, not too many scores at the beginning, it's a negative skew. So that's the way I remember it. Um, hopefully that helps you at uh, the way that you're going to remember it. Just look at the beginning of it and say, a lot of scores, positive skew. Beginning, low scores, negative skew. And that's the way I remember it, and I hope that was helpful. Remember, these are a brief review of terms of the chapter. Um, not meant to be comprehensive at all, but hopefully helpful to give you some idea of what to um, focus on and uh, understand. Okay, thank you.